Hello. So it is six thirty. Thank you, everyone who is is joining the uh, Green Book program. Thanks for taking time out of your evening to join us tonight. Um, Lisa is, as I speak, just come back. <laughs> um, so welcome. Thank you. And uh, don't worry if you're if this image looks a little bit odd. I was just saying before. I'm not sure if it's the uh, pan shirt or the funky colours behind me, but I don't think this camera can quite handle it, so um, <laughs> the colours seem a bit off. But uh, um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all, and um, I'll explain a little bit about how the Zoom webinars works for those that have maybe not done it before. Um, it's pretty easy, uh, so uh, you'll just see myself and Lisa, uh, our cameras, um, and we do have a QA and a at the end of Lisa's talk, and so if you do want to ask any questions, the easiest way is just to, if you click the chat little bubble um, on the bottom of your uh, screen, um, it will bring up a little sidebar and you can just type your questions in there. Um, you do have a raise hand function as well. So if you do want to ask questions and you want to be unmuted and you'd rather speak, uh, we can do that too. Uh, and if you have any really long questions, uh, then I've put my email address in the chat as well. So you feel free to just email me and if I can answer it, I will. If I can't, I'll pass it to Lisa and, and she might be able to answer that for you. So, um, yeah, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Lisa. Thank you for joining us as well tonight. Um, and just to introduce uh, Lisa, Lisa Withers is a doctoral candidate at North Carolina State University, where um, her research is all about the Green Book and, and the people associated with it and its listings. Uh, and Lisa will go into a bit about her research um, which is fascinating. Um, Lisa earned a BA in African and African-American studies um, with a history minor from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a master's in history with museum studies concentration from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and has been working all over museums and <laughs> museum work and history and even worked at the Mark as well. So uh, yeah, really thank you for joining us and um, I'll hand it over to you and I will turn my screen off so you don't have to look at my face. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> oh, you just need to unmute. There you go. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matthew, for the invitation to come back home. Uh, we are virtually, but I must still say I'm back home. Um, I am a native of Rockingham County. Um, and also, I, as Matthew mentioned, I did get my start in my current professional field at the Museum and Archives of Rockingham County. So being with you this evening is truly a joy, a delight um, to be able to come back and share. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing my screen. Technology, don't fail me now. So hopefully... Did that work? Oh, here we go, hit share. All right, and is everyone able to see the screen? Matthew? Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button fast enough. <laughs> yes, everything's great. <laughs> All right, cool, just wanna be sure everyone is able to see the screen. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and jump started. So hopefully we will end on time. As I did say, good evening and happy Memorial Day, everyone. My name is Lisa R. Withers, and I am very excited to be with you on this evening and joining the Museum of Ar Museum and Archives of Rockingham County for this webinar. And so on the screen, advance to the next slide, if it will go. There we go. On the screen is an overview of what I plan to talk about during our time together. The Negro Motorist Green Book, which I will refer to simply as the Green Book, has gained more public awareness in the past few years, particularly after the 2018 feature film starring Mahershala Ali and Viggo Mortensen. I plan to spend the first part of the presentation discussing the context, the contents, and the significance of the Green Book as a historical publication. Then spend the second part of the presentation sharing some early findings of my own dissertation research related to the listings in North Carolina. During the presentation, I invite everyone to feel free, as Matthew mentioned, to use the Q&A function, raise your hand, or drop your questions in the chat, and hopefully I will be able to answer them at the end, um, towards the end of our time together. 
And so going ahead and getting started. So I will start by giving a common definition of what is the Green Book and addressing the popular narrative generally found in a variety of media outlets. Often the Green Book is described as a travel guide, listing restaurants, nightclubs, hotels, tourist homes, beauty parlors, barbershops, tailors, and gas station among several categories used where it was known that African Americans could receive service without encountering racial discrimination prevalent during the Jim Crow era. The general narrative is that Victor Green was an African American postal worker in Harlem, New York, who published a guide between 1936 through 1966 in order to help African Americans while traveling. The physical book itself was small, approximately five inches in width, six and three quarters inches in length, and one half inch thick. A small booklet was beneficial as the Green Book could easily fit into a handbag, carry-on case, or even the glove compartment of a car. And so the narrative I just portrayed, or the narrative I just shared, it portrays or frames the Green Book, the Green Book through the lens of upper and middle-class African-Americans participating in leisure travel, most often interstate leisure travel on vacations and public dialogue. The predominant storyline is that African-Americans should travel by car with a box of food to avoid stopping at restaurants. There are many oral accounts or interviews of this particular travel narrative, as well as a number of archival images supporting this framework such as the two archival images on the screen to the left and the upper right. However, this popular framing of the Green Book does not acknowledge the multitude of reasons for travel or the diversity among African-Americans who are traveling during this era and establishing the larger context for the historical publication. For example, the Green Book was published during the latter years of the Great Migration when many African-Americans left the South and moved North and West. And this aspect of the African-American travel experience is also documented within archival sources, such as the image on the bottom right of African-Americans getting into a truck to migrate North from Florida. I will mention this point again later in the presentation. And so before taking a deeper look at the Green Book's contents, I would like to take a step back and look at the larger scope and context of black travel and what was going on related to transportation before and when the Green Book was published. African-Americans have often experienced difficulties when traveling or moving from place to place, especially when using public transportation, such as trains, streetcars, and later buses. For example, on September 29, 1841, Frederick Douglass and a traveling companion were forcibly removed from a train car where they attempted to travel first class with white passengers on the Eastern Railroad Company in Boston, Massachusetts. Another example is the story of Ida B. Wells, who was forcibly removed from a train car in 1884 after refusing to leave a first class passenger car intended for white women only. In 1904, in the city of Richmond, Virginia, African Americans led protests against the Virginia Passenger and Power Company, which operated with the policy of segregated seating on streetcars. From the 1910s through the 1960s, African Americans were still forced to follow restrictions on how they could travel when using public transportation. I share this information about African American struggles to travel using public transportation because it provides an opportunity to better understand the importance of automobiles within the African American community, particularly since the Green Book tends to be labeled as a publication catering to motorists. Mass production of the automobile during the first half of the 20th century would eventually allow African-Americans 
not only more opportunities to travel as generally depicted with upper and middle-class African-Americans, but to do so with increased independence. Automobiles and enclosed space on wheels provided African-Americans with a temporary means of escape from Jim Crow. Laws intended for social control and separation of public space based on race. You can think of the car as one's own personal bubble for the most part. Of course, riding in a car did not mean African-Americans were 100% protected from the outside world. But in contrast to public transportation, as long as you were inside your vehicle, you had a shield and could move about from place to place in relative safety without harassment. We witnessed this concept in practice in the descriptions of how individuals carried everything needed with them in their cars to avoid the need to stop along the way and break the barrier between the black traveler and Jim Crow society. Earlier, I mentioned the current popular narrative of the Green Book tends to lean more towards a middle-class story. Individuals who are more likely to either have access to an automobile, if not outright own one. It is true that automobiles were on the rise in accessibility and use during the time the Green Book was published. I should acknowledge that the publication title in several early editions included the word motorist. But that did not mean everyone or the majority of African-Americans had cars. And thinking about the broader scope of mobility, African-Americans were still using mass public transportation well into the 20th century. Bus companies such as Trailways and Greyhound were still an important mode of transportation across state lines in addition to trains. I bring up this point both from conducting oral histories or interviews with community members and from observation of Green Book listings located near train and bus station. On the screen are two examples of this geographic proximity. The postcard for the Biltmore Hotel in Durham notes that the hotel is, open quote, half block from using station, close quote, and the Roan Hotel in New Bern is situated right beside railroad tracks. Both of these Green Book listings are also located in towns along US Highway 70, a major east-west corridor within the state before the interstate system was built. So before I shift away from discussing the Green Book's larger historical context, I want to bring up that transportation was just as much of a battleground in civil rights history as education, voting, equal, and equal access to public spaces and employment. Earlier, I gave examples of African-Americans being removed from trains and streetcar protests in the 1800s and 1900s. The Green Book was published during and is part of a larger civil rights narrative. On the screen are three key ways in how transportation was used to fight racial discrimination. For decades, African-Americans took private companies and local municipalities to court over policies and ordinances. The picture on the screen is for a North Carolina case in 1952, when Sarah Louise Keyes, a member of the Women's Army Corps, traveled from New Jersey to visit her parents in Washington, North Carolina. When the bus driver stopped, when the bus stopped to change drivers, Keyes was ordered to give up her seat, but she refused. Keyes sued and her case was eventually brought before the Interstate Commerce Commission, which ruled in 1955 that the bus company violated federal laws banning racial segregation on interstate travel. In addition to using the legal system, African-Americans used direct action in the form of economic boycotts and demonstrations. It should be noted that majority of the bus passengers in urban areas were African-American. During the boycott, people either walked or community members who had cars 
organized a ride share network with pickup and drop off points to help sustain the boycott. When we take a step back and look at the bigger picture of African American travel, Black people going from place to place, we get a better sense of how the Green Book was one piece of a significantly larger effort of African Americans utilizing a variety of tactics to simultaneously tear down as well as navigate Jim Crow as safely as possible. And so in shifting to the Green Book itself, in publishing the Green Book from 1936 through 1966, Victor Green was responding to the needs of African-American travelers, as well as what was going on socially, politically, and culturally in the United States as experienced by the Black community. This is evidenced by studying the Green Book content and how it changed over the decades. In doing a deep dive of the publication content, I primarily want to draw attention to the organization of listings, publication name changes, the essays, and geographic scope covered. When we think about the common definition given for the Green Book as a travel guide, there is an impression that the publication was static, that it stayed the same and served only one function from 1936 through 1966. What I would like to point out is that the publication Victor Green created changed over time. It was a dynamic publication. Also, Victor Green was a postal worker, not a publisher by trade or profession. He saw a need and an opportunity and he took it. When we think about the publication from this perspective, it makes sense that the publication constantly changed as Green gained more experience in getting the publication out to his audience and continuing to meet their needs. On the screen is one example of how the publication changed over time. Early edition listed, included the listings by state, then by city or town, then by category headings, such as restaurant or filling station. As time went on, the organization of the publication changed to arrange listing only by state, then by city or town, and removing the subject heading categories altogether. It should also be noted that in the 1950s and 1960s, beauty parlors and barbershops were no longer listed. The same businesses were not always listed year after year, and this is true for all 30 years of the publication. And that with the Green Book, it only captured a fraction of the possible businesses where African-American travelers could find safe haven. In terms of who was listed and who was not, we must keep in mind that the Green Book was a crowdsourced publication. In talking about the Green Book as a constantly changing publication, let's also look at the titles. The Green Book has gone by several names over the 30 years it was published. I've included a chart of the titles on the screen. The publication starts off as the Negro Motors Green Book for about 14 years, or roughly the first half of its lifespan. The 1949 edition is the first one to use the words International Travel Guide. Additionally, from 1954 through 61, the publication title included the word vacation. From 1951 through 1959, the publication was entitled The Negro Traveler's Green Book, and it changed again to The Traveler's Green Book until it ceased publication. It should be noted that the word Negro was dropped from the title a few years after the Supreme Court case of Brown versus Board of Education, which made the concept of separate but equal unconstitutional and which was an underlying principle of Jim Crow. I would encourage everyone to not only note when the titles change, but also note the wording used in various titles. Paying attention to something as subtle as title changes throughout the publication's lifespan can give us additional clues to the messaging within the publication, 
or themes the intended audience would have picked up on in addition to further studying the visuals used within the guide and other content. I mentioned that the first half of the publication's life uses some form of the phrase Negro motorist. I would argue that this is not by accident, especially for a publication printed in the 1930s and 1940s. Historians of technology, travel, and tourism have demonstrated that machines, such as automobiles, were also racialized battlegrounds during the Jim Crow era. Scholars have pointed out how cartoons and newspaper editorials depicted African Americans as an inferior race based on the assumption of not being advanced enough to operate a car, let alone own one. So when we look at the Green Book within this larger cultural and social context of early 20th century popular media, its title by itself was doing important work in counteracting depictions of African Americans before World War II and demonstrating that African Americans do indeed own and operate a vehicle, plus can go where they need to go the same way as any white motorist. Another aspect of the content within the Green Book I want to highlight is the essays and travel advice found inside the publication. The Green Book did not simply list restaurants and hotels. The editors also gave driving and car maintenance advice plus information on different models of cars as seen in the essays in the 1938 and 1947 editions on the left side of the screen. Through its essays, the Green Book was a publication encouraging African Americans to travel. And this aspect of the guide is also apparent in the essays focusing on cultural attractions, examples of which are shown from the 1949 edition on the right side of the screen. In several editions, there are essays on certain cities with descriptions about what the location has to offer. When we think about the Green Book in its full historical context, these essays seem responsive to the times and practical, not just for safety and helping African-Americans debunk stereotypes by staying abreast of the automobile industry and maintenance, but also with essays in the publication overlapping with the golden age of vacationing in America which scholar Susan Ruff defines as from 1945 through 1970. In referring back to some of the titles used for the Green Book through the years, we should notice a fair amount of them include a broad geographic scope using the words covering the United States and international as early as 1947. I had a conversation with a community member who shared the belief that the Green Book was a publication solely to combat racism in the Southeastern United States. Flipping through the pages inside the Green Book reveal that its listings included almost all of the continental United States. Yes, the Southeast had visible signage and codified Jim Crow laws, but the Northeast, Midwest, Southwest, and Pacific Northwest also have their own racialized rules and customs, often unwritten, which I would say made traveling even more dangerous. The Midwest in particular was known for having sundown towns, places where African-Americans were not allowed and certainly not accepted in the area after dark. Even internationally, there are mixed stories or accounts from both more affluent African-Americans who traveled abroad, as well as stories told by African-American military veterans. For example, when we read the autobiographies and memoirs of individuals such as activist Mary Church Terrell or writer Claude McKay, they mention a sense of freedom in traveling to other countries as they were able to escape the racism in America. However, there are also accounts from African-Americans such as George Schuler, a, a journalist for the Pittsburgh Courier, who discussed feeling discriminated against or treated as an oddity when traveling abroad. Based on these accounts and others, it is not surprising to find international listings in the Green Book. 
As we study the pages of the Green Book as a publication, there is another aspect of the inclusion of international listings we should consider. The messaging we see in the Green Book in its geographic scope and the images published within the booklet is encouragement for African-Americans to not just travel, but to go see the world. We should remember that the Green Book was also published, was published over a period of three decades, part of which was during the same time there was a growing renewed interest in Africa and the African diaspora. For example, listed countries include Haiti, Brazil, Ethiopia, Ghana, and Nigeria. So to briefly recap the first portion of the presentation thus far, I've talked about the current popular narrative of the Green Book and its framing, addressed a broader historical context of African American travel history and the role of transportation within civil rights history when the Green Book was published, and took a deep dive into the publication's content. My goal in including this information in the presentation is to increase awareness as to how we talk about the historical publication and black travel in public conversations and in popular media outlets. In addition, I hope to raise awareness in the context of the era in which the Green Book was published, the Green Book's contents and its social and its societal function, and the role the publication played in the African-American lived experience. While a lot of information was shared, there is still more information available. So on the screen are the most recent publications for anyone who is interested in learning more background information. Um, two of these works were published early last year in 2020, and the third was published um, a few months ago in 2021. So as mentioned at the very beginning, I am a doctoral candidate in the public history program at North Carolina State University. And so my dissertation is also on the Green Book. It should be noted that for the state of North Carolina, during the 30 years that the Green Book was published, over 300 entries cumulatively were included for the state in both rural and urban areas. While the Green Book listings were located in most regions, not every county was represented in the publication for North Carolina. And so for my research, I am specifically interested in the people associated with the listings within the publication. I am using their biographies and the local histories of each city or town in my study to identify patterns and trends about the state's publication listings and what they may reveal about the African-American lived experience in North Carolina and about travel in the state. And so, as I mentioned, there are over 300 listings for the state. And so to help narrow it down, my research parameters, I've used two highways, U.S. Highway 70, which goes east to west from the Outer Banks through Asheville to the Tennessee border, and U.S. Highway 29, which goes from the Virginia border in the Piedmont, heading south to Charlotte and the South Carolina border. While only looking at these two highways does not capture the full Green Book story for North Carolina, it is a starting point that is manageable for a dissertation and allows me to include both urban and rural areas within the study. And so for the second portion of this presentation, I would like to just share some of the early findings that I found thus far in research. And there are three in total that I'd like to share. And so the first trend that I've begun to identify surfacing among my research is that Green Book listings, they tended to be community meeting location or gathering places. And searching through historically African-American newspapers in North Carolina has revealed hotels such as Hotel Alexander in Charlotte were places where clubs and organizations held business meetings and social events. The Biltmore Hotel in Durham and the Arcade Hotel in Raleigh also function in this manner as a social and community gathering location in their respective cities. Additionally, in Goldsboro, North Carolina, Thornton's Teenage Casino and Shaving Parlor was a known hangout spot for youth in the area. Mr. Thornton used one half of the building for his barbershop and the other half as a hangout location for youth. 
When doing an oral history or an interview with the current owner of the deluxe barbershop in Durham, the owner described the barbershop in a similar manner. It wasn't just a place of business, but also a communal hangout where, in which he described was the black man's country club where a person could find anything that was needed. Additionally, the deluxe barbershop also housed a well-known daycare in the basement and was a place for both youth and adults in the community. So why does this matter? Places like hotels and barbershops were not solely providing lodging or other services for travelers. They held double duty as gathering places within the community. In less populous areas such as Goldsboro, the places listed in the Green Book may indicate where community members gathered. In this way, the Green Book is not only a listing of places where a traveler could find goods or services, it could also be interpreted as a record of gathering places found within African American communities in both urban and rural areas. And so the second trend that is starting to appear among several of the listings that I have found or that I've begun to do research on is that Green Book proprietors, they tended to have connections to organizations that these organizations themselves were known to already have established networks. And some of the Green Book owners are also individuals who were politically as well as civically active within their communities. And so for example, I have found several Green Book listings that have connections to the NAACP, um, a key African-American organization um, particularly when we talk about um, fighting Jim Crow and during the civil rights era. Um, one example is the image on the far left is of TV Mangum. Mr. Mangum, he was from Statesville in Iredale County. He was a mortician, but he also um, in his later years built the Evening Breeze Motel, which was listed in the Green Book for Iredale County. But he also worked um, he, was, he served, excuse me, as the president of the NAACP on the state level in his early years of formation, and he also ran for political office in the 1960s. And also thinking about other ways and how we think about organizations with pre-existing networks. The railroad is something that has come up a few times in my research, and this is true in Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville was a Western hub and was a railroad hub in the Western part of the state. YMI uh, research at the YMI Cultural Center revealed that there was an active chapter of the Brotherhood of Pullman Car Porters in Asheville. And one of those Pullman Porters was Samuel C. Foster, who was a member of the Brotherhood. And his house was listed as a tourist home in the Green Book for Asheville. And his wife, Laura Jo, was also a member of the Ladies Auxiliary Chapter. And that is the image that you see on the right side of the screen is of the ladies auxiliary chapter of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in Asheville, North Carolina. In other parts of the state, unsurprisingly, I have found promoters in the entertainment industry, which is generally connected to the Chitlin circuit. Also, another aspect of Black travel often connected to the Green Book. And so two examples of that include Mason James, who was the owner of the James Keys Hotel, also in Asheville. He operated as a promoter and had a music agency booking musicians and performers in the area. There's also Lathrop Austin, who was a manager of the Biltmore Hotel in Durham. And he too worked as a promoter in the music industry. So why does it matter that multiple Green Book listings have connections to organizations with well-established networks. The Green Book, it matters because the Green Book was, appears to be built on and expanded by pre-existing networks of other organizations. By recognizing the interconnection of these networks that forms the Green Book, a study of the publication encourages critical thought as to how information traveled within and between communities. Additionally, several of the listings studied thus far so just the Green Book was not just about businesses looking to advertise to African-American travelers, but rather these listings suggest that one way to think about the Green Book is a printed version of multiple pre-existing networks within the African-American community that was put, put into one location to help facilitate African-American travel. And so the third finding that I would like to share 
is that the Green Book listings either helped people to migrate for better social economic opportunities, or the proprietors have participated in travel themselves for social economic mobility before becoming entrepreneurs. And so two examples of that. The first, the, the image that you see on the top of the screen is related to the YWCA in Asheville. Within a collection of oral histories found at Pack Library, there were a collection, there were recollections of the YWCA having various spaces for travelers. One Astro resident recalled when the YWCA building had offices on the first floor and on the second floor were rooms for out of town African-American women since, and I quote, the ability and certainty of obtaining a respectable home was important to all job seekers, end quote. Likewise, another community member recalled the YWCA providing dormitory space for African-American women who were looking for work in Asheville. So essentially, as women were coming to Asheville from rural areas in Western North Carolina looking for work, the YWCA would provide temporary residence as these women were looking for jobs. And again, this is related to the picture at the top of the screen. Um, this building is most likely the dormitory that is referred to in the oral histories, both due to its design and the sign on the side that says the Phyllis Wheatley Branch YWCA. YMCAs and YWCAs were known to have lodging spaces that were often used by travelers. The YMCA in Raleigh, North Carolina is another example of a Y providing lodging and is also listed in the Green Book as well. And my last example, which you see at the bottom of the screen, is for Harris East End Service Station. Taylor B. Harris is identified as the operator of the Harris East End Service Station, a Green Book listing in Greensboro, North Carolina. Harris was born in Alabama in 1911 and grew up as a farmer. According to census records, by 1940, Harris was living in Greensboro with his uncle and a household of 12 people, all family members. Of the 12 family members in the household, eight were living in Selma, Alabama, five years before in 1935. The four family members who were born in North Carolina were all under the age of five years old. I found Harris in various primary sources as working in Philadelphia by 1945. By 1950, he shows up again in primary source records as having moved back to Greensboro, North Carolina, and by this time was working as a firefighter at North Carolina A&T University, or at that time, college. During the 1950s and 1960s, Harris is also listed in city directories as owning the gas station, which was listed in the Green Book in 1961. And this listing is what is shown at the bottom of the screen. So why does this matter? Earlier in the presentation, I mentioned that often told, the often told popular narrative of the Green Book, it tends to frame this narrative on the publication as related to the experiences of upper middle class African Americans seeking to enjoy vacation travel without experiencing racial discrimination. However, research on the places listed within, such as the Asheville YWCA and the people who operate a Green Book listing, such as Harris Taylor, reveal that the Green Book is connected to travel narratives related to social economic mobility, particularly during the period of the Great Migration. And so to conclude, in the editorials of several editions of the Green Book, Victor Green wrote of a dream that one day the travel guide he published would no longer be necessary. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited discrimination in many aspects of American life, including public transportation. It could be argued that the individuals who continued publication of the Green Book at that time believed Victor Green's dream came true as the last known publication of the Green Book printed in 1966. The Green Book is not, was, was not only important because it functioned as a travel guide or rather as a survival guide for African-Americans going from place to place. I discussed early in the presentation about African-American experiences with public transportation to demonstrate the importance of automobile travel within the African-American community and the role of transportation in civil rights history. When placed in historical context with events such as the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 and the Freedom Rides of 1961, 
The creation and the use of the Green Book was one of many strategies and tools in which African Americans used in the long struggle to claim, maintain, and preserve rights as citizens of the United States. And that includes the freedom of movement or travel from place to place without fear. And so that is the end of my prepared presentation. I thank you for your time this evening and for joining the museum for this webinar. And I will turn the floor back over to Matthew and hope to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. It was a fantastic presentation. Um, I'll give you a round of applause, but it would just be myself uh, since we can't hear anyone else. But <laughs> that, was, that was really wonderful. Thank you. And those pictures were fantastic too. Um, now, I know that uh, some will have questions about the uh, books and, and how to um, get those recommendations. What we'll have is we will have this uh, presentation will be on our on the museum's YouTube channel uh, and we'll pop those book recommendations, uh, maybe with a little bit from from your presentation as well on uh, on our website blog as well. So um, probably by next week. So just look out for that one. We'll uh, put it on Facebook and all that. Um, if you've got any questions, please do ask. Um, I did notice there were uh, there was one in particular um, from Sydney Gringo uh, said, did any of the additions include information about areas uh, area churches as safe havens? Um, so I'll leave that one to yourself, um, Lisa. Yeah. Interesting enough, ch churches are one of several categories, if you will, of places that were not included in the Green Book. Um, I know over the past two or three years that I've done work in other capacity doing research on this topic, um, particularly some of the resort places in North Carolina, such as Sea Breeze outside of Wilmington. Um, there's Choan Beach um, also uh, the name just slipped as I was getting ready to say it, but there's also a park out near Wally, Jones Lake, there it is, Jones Lake. Um, places that were designated specifically for African-Americans, but they weren't included um, in, in the Green Book. So there are a lot of places, um, as I've talked with community members, that was a common question of why certain places were included, but others were not. I still don't have an answer for that as part of what driving my current research and hoping to maybe figure that out. Um, but it is, it is really interesting in that when you look at the total number, especially for a place like Durham, I think in the total 30 years, only 30 some places were listed in Durham, which clearly, you know, there are way many more African-American businesses um, in that area that probably could have been listed, but for some reason or another weren't included. So yeah, fortunate no searches. Uh, and I guess one of the other questions, one by Deidre Kearney, actually touches on that, saying, did businesses pay to be listed? Oh, I'm sorry, was the last part? Uh, did businesses pay to be listed? Um, I believe in, from some of what I've read in some of the secondary sources, as the Green Book continued on in publication, as it became more known through various networks, um, there were some, it was, it's my understanding that it was always a crowdsource publication. Um, all of the ones that I have referenced, in fact, some of the images that I included were from the digitized editions of the Green Book, which you can find through the New York Public Library. Um, and you can find like on the back, there's like a submission form, if you will. You can write your inf information, tear it off and send it in to Victor Green in New York. And he had a publishing company that produced the Green Book. Um, so there was also that way. And as, as I was saying before, as the Green Book became more established and more known, um, there were some businesses that did pay to, like, so he solicited businesses to include advertisements in the Green Book as well. Victor Green also had agents and he also partnered with um, travel agents. Um, and the major company that partnered with Victor Green was Esso. Well, at that time, it was Esso, now known as Exxon, in which, because of their franchise, and they were a franchise that were known for not turning away African Americans, particularly if they not just to buy gas, but to also let them use restrooms to stop and do other things that they needed to do. They were also a big way in how the Green Book was distributed. And you can also imagine with their marketing people, they also helped to include things in as well. So, um, oh, that's as interesting. I yeah, so as I mentioned before, like as, as the, the Green Book grew, there became more in other ways and how things were listed, but 
it still doesn't fully answer for us why some places were in it and others were not. And so, um, and I guess one that I'm just kind of jump in just because one kind of touches on that. Um, Judy Piper mentioned, was it supposed to be kind of a money maker <laughs> in her words? Was it supposed to be a for profit? Um, publication it doesn't seem so i mean the earliest ones were for sold for 25 cents i think i would need to go back and look i think the highest i think in the 1960s they sold for like a dollar 25 okay yeah so it only went up by about like 25 cents throughout the 30 years so starting at like 25 cents and ending about roughly a dollar dollar 25 not bad inflation yeah <laughs> <laughs> not bad but like also i don't uh, you know, Victor Green, his primary job was as a postal worker. You know, that's where he primarily did his main income. And so, well, it's sometimes an often kid, like you could think of it as, you know, a civic activist kind of side hustle. It doesn't it seem like it was ever really actually for profit, but rather it's for in this larger spirit of this is an issue, an issue facing community as a whole. Here is a one way in both as to help people, but also in fighting against in the various ways that it did. Absolutely. Um, and one of the, um, Philip Atkins has mentioned about uh, public libraries being a, a potential source um, of information. Are, are there any places that you would recommend where people might be able to see copies of, of the Green Book or, or even originals? <laughs> Man. So the finding an original is very difficult. I have only seen an original one time. I know the North Carolina Museum of History in downtown Raleigh, they did have one on display for a temporary exhibit. I want to say this may have been about two years ago now, and this was in partnership with the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission. It is a state agency within the state of North Carolina. They underwent a major project um, in collecting information about listings in the green books. And so they work together to produce a small exhibit. And that's the only place I've been able to find an original one. They are, first editions are hard to find. However, you can purchase copies online. And there is a particular company, I will try to email that information to you. You can share it with other people. There is one particular company that has been doing reprints of about three different editions and they also have a compilation value so they took like four different editions put them together in one volume and there's a preface or a foreword um, uh -huh. by a scholar and i need to look at if it's either um henry lewis gates jr or dr lonnie bunch secretary of the smithsonian institution one of those two i can't remember they wrote a foreword to it and you can also purchase that as well um and so as oh, far fantastic. As, yeah yeah being <laughs> able to see them yeah. yeah, there's not many around. Makes a difference. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes a difference. But for anyone who is embarking on any kind of travel this summer, the Smithsonian Institution has their own traveling exhibit about the Green Book that's currently touring the country. There is also a digital exhibit as well as a traveling exhibit in the state of North Carolina. Again, that is through the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission. And there have been a number of children's books. I believe one is by Calvin Ramsey. It's called Ruth in the Green Book. And that was actually out a few years, even before the Green Book itself came back in the public awareness through the movie and everything that came out in 2018. So if you go to your public library, you might be able to find the children's book by Calvin Ramsey um, and hopefully share it with your young people. And oh, uh, yeah, Daryl uh, Watkins had mentioned that they were able to purchase copies at Magnolia House in Greensboro. Not sure if that's still the case, but um, yeah, yeah, we'll, they, we'll... yeah, they are. So there are, uh, unfortunately, so as I mentioned, there are over 300 places in the state of North Carolina that were listed over the 30 year period. Unfortunately, majority of them no longer exist either as a business or the physical structure is gone. And a lot of that is for a variety of reasons going from urban renewal in 1960s, 1970s, even as we go through the 80s and 90s and into the now in the 2000s with gentrification, other urban programs, or in rural areas um, as communities have unfortunately you know, existed as they did um, in earlier decades. Um, and so the Magnolia House is one of the few 
not only is it still standing, but the owner's doing fantastic um, programming and things, bringing it back to the way it was when it was listed in the Green Book in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, definitely, so anyone here who is joining us, who is anywhere near the Greensboro area, please go visit the Magnolia House. Awesome place, awesome programming, awesome folks too. And uh, Judy uh, just said as well, uh, that uh, understood that there were four Green Book lodging sites operating still in North Carolina, Magnolia House being one of those mm -hmm. in Greensboro, and just wondered what the other three were. It's kind of putting you a bit on the spot there, but if... No, no worries. <laughs> I, used, I used to be able to rally these <laughs> off a of heart, but it's been like a year or so. Um, as far as the actual business still operating, I do believe it is Dove Auto Service Station. Well, it's really uh, it's a car garage. That's in Kinston, North Carolina. Um, Mr. Dove Sr. started it in the early 1900s and then his son took it over. Um, and so to my knowledge, at least as far as March of this year, last time I had any contact, they were still in operation as a family owned business. I think with the others, it is the physical structure. So also in Greensboro, what was the Plaza Manor Hotel, which is not too far away from um, I'm sorry, Magnolia House, that physical structure is still standing as it was built when it was built in the late 1940s. Um, that's is also in Greensboro. Her what I was mentioning earlier is Harris East End Service Station. That physical structure still there is just down the street from A&T on Market Street. Um, and so that is still standing. There are a few, when I say a few, I'm talking about like less, this is off the top of my head. I need to go back and see if I can find that. We'll hold you to it, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like, when it comes to physical structures, like the structures themselves, I think it's less than 30. I mean, the number one that comes to mind is the Excelsior Club in Charlotte, which was a uh, prominent African-American nightclub in the Charlotte area. And I believe that physical structure is still standing. And there, I know in the past year or so, there's been a lot of efforts to preserve it, especially as it became more known as being a place that was also listed in the Green Book as well. And so even though we have lost majority of those businesses, of what is rem does remain, there has been increased awareness over the past two to three years. And there have been communities who have, there has definitely been, um, rallying around them which is really awesome to see to help save those structures oh fantastic um i don't think we've got any other questions um but yeah we may finish a little bit early we we uh, got through those questions uh, a little bit quicker but thank you um like i say I, I'll, I'll put all of those resources um on the youtube channel on the website and uh, update it on facebook too uh, but if anyone has, hasn't got any other questions, uh, or you can email me questions if they're particularly long, um, please do. My email is just at the top of the chat box. And um, thank you again, Lisa. I appreciate you doing the presentation. It was fantastic and answering those questions uh, on the spot. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> and, um, thank you, everyone, for joining. <laughs> it was great. Um, appreciate it. All right. So thank right. you, everyone. Hope you enjoy the rest of your Memorial Day. Bye. Likewise. Take care, everyone.